الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم المصطفى محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المأصومين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, brothers and sisters in the religion of Islam, indeed any viewers who may be tuning in from other religions, I would like to welcome you back to this episode with the Islamic greetings of peace and mercy, the greeting by which the prophets have taught us to address others. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Of course, in the previous episodes, we had introduced the clear, complex, and difficult task which lays ahead of anyone who is researching, indeed studying, investigating, looking into the historical tragedy, the historical calamity which befell the mother of 11 of the Imams, 11 of the holy Imams, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her and her husband and her father and her children. Namely, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Of course, for those who are within the body of the faith, they would know that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam holds a particularly renowned and elevated status within the religion. Indeed, she is addressed by certain titles, titles which are unique to her and her alone. She is, for example, referred to as Umma Biha, the mother of her own father. She is, of course, referred to as Rehanatun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala, the sweet smelling basil which emanates from the gardens of Jannah. Lady Fatima, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon her, is not merely some ordinary woman. She is not an ordinary person. In fact, to this nation, and by that I mean the nation of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, she is one of the 14 infallible ones. The wife of the first Imam, the daughter of the seal of the prophets. And for this reason, she is held in high estimation. Of course, this series is not to discuss who Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam is in great detail for two primary reasons. Indeed, for me to even give a brief introduction to even scratch the most primitive of surfaces, I would require hours upon hours to speak about the blessed maqam of Fatima al-Zahra. And that is something I would be unable to do a decent level of justice to. And so tonight I wish to continue discussing one of the more important topics. Of course, when I introduce these nights as commemorating, as looking back at, 
as a reminder of the very martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra what I'm doing is I'm making an affirmative statement. I'm essentially stating that Lady Fatima, Fatima to Zahra, is someone who departed this world not with an ordinary death. She did not die of old age, for example. She did not die of what we would call a natural human passing away. Rather, in order for us to give her the status of martyrdom, there is something that happened to her. She was martyred in order to have the rank and honor of martyrdom. But of course, who martyred Fatima? How did this occur? And why is it that so many of the non-Shia who might be viewing this channel have never heard of such an event? Is such an event agreed upon? Is there a dispute surrounding it? And more importantly, how do we know that she was martyred? These are all important questions which must be answered. And in order to do so, we need to attempt to look at the question of how we can know anything about what happened to Fatima salam. How is it possible that we can make any certain claims about those tragedies which in our opinion and according to the message which we preach means that Fatima to Zahra salam, departed this world as an oppressed victim as someone whose rights were trampled upon as someone who was angry with her oppressors of course when we talk about such topics it is very very clear that not only are we putting forward a message to those who believe in the martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra but also we are to some degree intentionally or unintentionally scratching an irritation in the hearts, minds and also lives of those who would deny that such an event occurred. Now of course this is something which has been discussed in numerous circles whether or not Fatima to Zahra was indeed martyred. And of course you have a camp who would vehemently deny it and you have a camp who would argue that this is the most important detail of Islamic history. I reiterate something which I normally state when coming onto any television network, which is that my words represent myself and myself alone. What I am saying tonight does not ne necessarily represent the thoughts of the Imam Hussein television network nor am I bound by anything else which is said on this TV network. But allow me to state this. When analyzing this topic, because of the sensitivities involved, we wish to take a strategy which is well known in the Arab world. We wish to take the strategy which is encouraged by Islam, the middle straight and just balanced way. That is to say, as we would say in Arabic, la ifrat wa la tafrit. We don't want to go extremely to the right, nor do we want to go extremely to the left. We don't want to take exaggerated positions. So what I wish to put forward tonight is that in order for us to get anywhere with this particular topic, we need to be number one, objective, number two academic what do I mean by that anyone when they're writing a PhD thesis in academia 
if we're writing within a, a field of history, particularly within a field of religious history, but it could also be within national history, medieval history, the history of a particular region, you have to understand that there are certain sensitivities involved. There are people who may come from a certain region, and so when discussing, for example, the history of Australia, you may wish to take particular care in announcing to the world that many of those who journeyed to Australia originally, particularly from the British Isles, were sent there on penal colonies. We may wish to be very sensitive when it comes to describing the practices of certain ancestors of any group. And we may wish to be very sensitive when it comes to questioning statistics of any given massacre within world history. For indeed the survivors of those massacres who share a collective history may very well be offended by the questioning of those statistics. That is not to say these discussions should be avoided altogether, no. What am I proposing is merely that we are objective, we are as loyal to the evidence and facts as possible, but more importantly than that, we also take into account sensitivities. I'm suggesting tonight that in order for us to move forward, we must take extreme diligent care and how we are to investigate this topic. We must take extreme diligent care in not offending anyone, in not coming across as hate preachers. For indeed, our purpose is not to offend, and our purpose is not to give a one-sided, wishy-washy, washed out, whitewashed version of history which fails to take into account any other nuanced reading of history. This topic is one which is perceived by many to be related directly to issues of belief and creed as opposed to just another historical investigation. And of course it's best to take a moderate stance in regards to these issues, that which is creedal is to say that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam definitely died oppressed. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was mavluma. She was an oppressed lady. As for the details, let's not try to ram these details down anybody's throats. That doesn't help. But as the great historian of the 20th century, writing about modern American history, Howard Zinn has stated, history is like a moving train. You can't just sit on the fence. You have to either get on it or off it. You have to take a position at times. I remember one of the great novels which I read as a child, Ulysses, by I believe, Richard Royce, has one of the characters, Stephen, in his fictional novel stating that history is the nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. Now, of course, that is the nature of history. There's a lot of bias involved, and it's written by a particular camp. It's often written, as Western civilization holds it, by the victor. History is often written by the dominant camp who succeed in terms of number and therefore wipe out by minority reading. But it is my firm conviction that if we try our hardest to scratch the surface, we can definitely do so, inshallah ta'ala. I would like to begin by discussing how we are to look at history. There are some out there who would say things like, is it sahih at a senate? Does this have an accurate chain of narration? Can we apply the standards of ilm al-rajal, 
علم الجرح والتعديل to the science of history it's a great question there are certain people today who seem to believe that this is the standards of the ulama when I state this I'm initially talking about internally within particularly a Shi'i camp you would find those online who ask questions like is this particular narration sahih and so, in order for us to do justice, I would like to ask the question, is this how the ulama, the scholars of analyzing history have looked at history, yes or no? When it comes to looking at history, there must be certain guidelines which we take in order to understand that which is accurate and that which is inaccurate and we could approximately divide this into three principal methodologies the first methodology would be to accept everything which is found within the books of history which is found within the chronicles of any nation which is found within the annals of historical documentation and of course we would have to believe in it and give it a level of authoritativeness. We would consider it all to be reliable. Of course, no such rational person would accept this to be an accurate means of deriving history. Particularly when we would see that every historical book is plagued by particular biases that you may have one source making extremely odd claims with zero vindication and the source would be of an extremely dubious nature the source would be one which contradicts every other account in this regard when such would be the case it is not rational it is not rationally sustainable that we would depend upon such accounts of history. And so this first methodology of accepting everything, giving everything which is found in the chronicles of history, everything which is found in those things which are written down about history and recognizing them to be truthful and believing in all of it, this is something which must be rejected. The second approach would be to reject every historical report. Now, of course, this is a level of skepticism which no one, no one has ever utilized when analyzing history. And of course, if we were to utilize this approach, nothing would be considered to be true. The third approach, which is part of the three approaches, which we consider to be fallacious, is of course to analyze the reports of history and to measure them up using the strictest of criteria that we would only utilize in a court of law. To utilize a strict criteria which would only be utilized when cross-examining witnesses at the highest level. Now of course, again, one might consider this the approach where one looks for only a sahih isnad. One utilizes the methodology utilized when judging halal and haram, utilized when judging matters of aqaid, which is to demand something which is either sahih at sanad or what we would call mutawatir, mass transmitted generation by generation. 
Now, of course, whilst this method would allow for impeccable details to be filtered, what it would also do is leave us as absolute agnostics in regards to history and the historical facts of any single nation. Indeed, such an approach would be detrimental when it comes to looking at things like the prophetic biography or any of the other early historical reports pertaining to the Muslims, pertaining to classical civilizations which are now extinct and those which are studied profusely and heavily by the historians of academia. So given that these three approaches are considered problematic, what then would remain as the most acceptable methodology? The most acceptable methodology would be, of course, to say that we analyze historical reports according to looking at that which is famous and also by looking at the biographies of those who gathered such reports. When I say those things which are famous, we want to look at which of the early historical books document this. And are there external verifying factors, what we would call qara'in, contextual indicators, which provide us with good reason to believe that the account mentioned in these historical books is reliable? We find that within Shia scholarship, there is no dependence upon the classical fiqhi method of authenticating reports when it comes to looking at history. For example, when we look at something written by one of the great ulama, Sheikh Kashif al Ghita, he states in regards to a question he was asked about a particular historical issue. He says the following: "Naam, Khabar Zaid bin Arqam wa Ibn Waqida kalahuma fi baav al kutub al muqtabara." Yes, certainly. The report of Zaid bin Arqam and Waqida were both found in some of the historical, sorry, in some of the books which are reliable. He goes on to state. والمراد هنا الاعتبار التاريخي لا الاعتبار الذي عليه المدار في الاخبار التي يستنبط منها الاحكام الشرعية من الصحيحة والحسن والموثق And when I say reliable here, Kashif al-Ghita goes on to state, he says I mean historical reliability. I don't mean the reliability which one depends upon in issues of fiqhi or jurisprudential derivation. I don't mean those reports by which laws are derived, by which we have to depend upon sahih and hasan and muwathiq. Bal huwa min qabil qawlana Tariq al-Tabari wa Tariq ibn Athir Mu'tabaran Rather, this is authentic in the way we would say that Tariq al-Tabari and Tariq ibn Athir are authentic books Wa yakfi fi hadha al-ma'na min al-i'tabar lil-khabar an yanqaluhu mithl sahib al-bihar wa turayhi fi al-muntakhab فضلاً عما رواه سيد بن تاووس في اللحوف وشيخ المفيد في الإرشاد And so such reports are just like the way we would depend upon someone like Sahib al-Bihar Alam al-Majlisi or Turayhi ibn Tawus and Sheikh al-Mufid in their books of history Of course 
Kashif al Ghita is not the only one to utilize this methodology from our ulama. A Sayyid Muhsin al Amin, one of the great, 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 great scholars, namely Sahab Kitab, the one who wrote the book, Ayan al Shia, the pillars of the Shia, of the great ones of the Shia, a book of the biographies of the great Shia from the very early inception of Tashayu and Islam right down to the time of the author Sayyid Muhsin al Amin. He states, Laysa Nashal Balagha, Najal Balagha, the book written by Sharif al Ravi, or get compiled by Sharif al Ravi, I should say. Laysa Najal Balagha, Marjan. للأحكام الشرعية حتى نبحث عن أسانيده. National Balaga is not a book which we utilize to derive fiqhi jurisprudential rulings in order for us to even look at its isnads, its chains of narration, the men who, rep who report these particular traditions from Amir al Mu'mineen. حتى نبحث عن أسانيده. وَنُوصِلُهُ وَلَا عَلِيهِ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ إِنَّمَا هُوَ مُنْتَخَبْ مِنْ كَلَامِهِ فِي الْمُوَاعِذِ وَالنَّصَائِحِ وَعَنْوَى مَا يَعْتَمِدُهُ وَالْخُطَبَاءِ مِنْ مَقَاسِدِهِمْ Rather, the book Nasha Balaga is something which gives us general ethical guidance and advices and types of words which would be depended upon by the speakers, by those who give religious lectures, those who give speeches. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ غَرَضْ جَمَعْهُ إِلَّا جَمَعْ قُسْمْ مِنْ كَلَامَ السَّابِقْ فِي مَيْدَانَ الْفُصَهَا وَالْبُلَغَاءِ أَلَا حَدْ مَا جَمَعْ غَيْرَهِ مِنْ كَلَامَ الْفُصَهَا وَالْبُلَغَاءِ الجاهلين والإسلاميين. and the intended purpose of gathering Najwa Balag was nothing other than to gather the collective wisdoms of those who were eloquent in speech just like previous books had been gathered about those eloquent in speech from the time of pre-Islamic era and also Islamic times As-Sahaba وغيرهم بسند وبغير سند ولم نركم ولم ولم نراكم تعترضون على أحد في نقله لخطبة أو كلام بدون سند وهو في الكتب يفوق الحد. He says, and we've not seen people complain about people gathering such words. Without sellers before. They have a little shape. They have a little shape. Allah was sorry, Muhammad and Muhammad. Muhammad. And nafs. Ma in a jill, ma fi he marwi bil asanid al kutub al mashura al matadawala. So, of course. With that, there's nothing which is reported except that its chains are found in more famous books which are already available. So looking at the Isnads and the four categorical grading, the division into Sahih, Muwaffaq, Hassan, and Vaif, Al Ma'roof in the Shia, the famous gradings in the Shia. In the Mahua Khas bin Rawayat, Elliti Tahawi Ahkam and Sharian Ilzamiya. Rather, these four gradings are utilized only for those hadith which give us specific jurisprudential rulings. Amma Gheraha, Fala Yushtarat fi Havalik. As for things which don't give us jurisprudential rulings, or talk about aqaid, for example, they 
are not expected to reach this level of rigorous investigation of authenticity. بَلْ يَكْفِي فِيهِ حُصُولَ الْإِتْمِئَنَانِ مِنْ أَيُّ مَنْشَأْ أَقْلَائِ or أُقَلَائِ Rather, what is sufficient for us is what we would call conventional إِتْمِئَنَان إِتْمِئَنَان being that which gives us comfort that which we are comfortable with that which gives us a degree of well, I can trust that what we would call conventional certainty as opposed to the level of qat that we expect when we're looking at jurisprudential rulings. And that makes perfect sense. This is something that rational people do. When they're trusting historical reports, they don't look in a way they would look into a report that requires them to make a quick action. Now, of course, is this something restricted to amongst the people of history, amongst the Shia? Absolutely not. For we find that numerous great scholars in the field of Ilm al-Rajal, amongst the Shia, including his eminence, a Sayyid Abu al-Qasim al khui who is considered to be one of the greatest leaders in the science of Ilm al-Rajal today, have also stated that when it comes to historicity, we don't need to utilize the most rigid of Ilm al-Rajal in determining Sahih and Dhaif. For he states in looking at certain individuals. Number one, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari radiyallahu an. He states, وَفِي هَذْهِ الرَّوَايَاتِ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ كُلَّهَا ضَعِيفَةً إِلَّا عِنَّ جَلَالَةْ مَقَامْ جَابِرْ وَاضَهَا مَعْلُومَةً وَلَا هَاجَ مَعْهُ عَلَيْهَا He says, and with all these reports, about the greatness of Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, the great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Yes, all these reports may be individually weak according to the standards of Al-Murrajal. But with that, the maqam and the greatness of the position of Jabir is clear, known, and there's no need for Sahih Asnads in this regard. He also states in regards to Amr ibn Humak al Huzai, another one of the great companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Inna ma taqaddam min al rawayat wa in kanit kul ha daifat al sanad illa inna ha mustafiva ala inna jalalat Amr ibn Humak al Huzai min al wadahat alati la yatari ha shak. مضافاً إلى أن شهادة البرق على أنه كان من شرطة الخميس فيها كفاية. He says, what has come before of these narrations of these riwayat, and even if they are all weak by sanad, they are nonetheless mustafif. They are nonetheless famous, they've reached a level of conventional certainty. <laughs> that the greatness of Amr al Muhammad al Khuzai is from the Wadahat, those things which are clear, in which there is no doubt, in addition to the fact that Al Barqi, the scholar of Rajal, states that he is from the Shurtat al khamis the police of Amir al-Mu'maneen, and in that there is sufficiency. So, when we see that the Shia scholars have not put down these stringent conditions 
of analyzing history, we must understand that what is being said, what is being alluded to, whenever we look at the books of historical reports, is not something which we apply the stringent standards of judging halal and haram with. Now, of course, I believe we've run out of time, dear viewers, and so I wish to round off our discussion tonight and continue this on a separate occasion. But I would like to conclude by stating that, again, we have seen that when it comes to history, the ulama of the Shia minimally within the camp of the intellectuals of the Shia do not demand what we would call rijali certainty or siha in terms of ilm al to be applied to historical accounts. So when we see someone come forward and say that all of these rawayat are weak, it shows that they are not familiar with how history is traditionally studied within the Shia school of thought. And inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow, if we have the opportunity, I'll continue in which we look at how history is analyzed within the Sunni schools of thought as well. Have a sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ahli bayta tayyibin al-tahirin. Fatima, ya Zahra.